Good afternoon and good morning, good evening. Um, welcome to this next webinar within the layer webinar series that we have um, started a while back already. Um, today, um, we are honored to have um, Ludio with us. Um, so Ludio uh, Gomez is a poultry veterinarian. He's from Brazil. And Ludio uh, has 20 years of experience as a veterinarian in the poultry health and production industry. So he's been working with parent stock, broilers, hatcheries. So he worked as a poultry technical manager for several animal health companies in Latin America and Asia, Pacific area. And currently he's working as a technical manager for Vaccinova, Asia Pacific. He's based in Bangkok, Thailand, and that is uh, the location from which he will be presenting to us today about uh, vaccination and poultry diseases in layers. Um, Ludio, floor, floor is for you to, to shortly introduce yourself and say hi, hi to the attendees. So hi, everybody. So it's, it's good to be here. Thank you, first of all, to the Nutrition for the invitation. I think uh, we have a good opportunity now to discuss uh, me, uh, the reason why I put this, like why the vaccine fails sometimes. So basic uh, questions and I am bringing uh, more and more information for the daily basis for the practical perspective. So crossing what the uh, experience that I had also in Latin America, mostly in Brazil, in um, working here in Southeast Asia. So, so um, uh, Ludio will be start the presentation in uh, in a few minutes. Um, just some uh, explanation on how this works for those that are new to the to the webinar series. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q and A icon, and that is where you can post questions. These questions um, will be addressed in the Q and A session at the end of the webinar, or if we are able, my panelists, my, my co-panelists and myself, if we are able to answer these questions uh, uh, through during the webinar, we will do so. Any question that is, um, that is uh, really uh, 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 important to have Ludio answering it or a question that is uh, of general interest to the, to the audience, we will, we will address it in the, in the Q&A session in the last 10, 15 minutes of the webinar. Um, at the end of the webinar, there will be a poll. So we ask you to take one minute of your time to leave uh, your, to, to, uh, to tell us how you experienced the webinar so we can use this for future improvements of our, of our webinar series. Um, so um, explain that I will be functioning as a panelist and I will do so together with my colleague, Ritraj Patil. Ritraj, please introduce yourself. Hi, hi all. Uh, my name is Ruturaj Patil. I'm, I'm working as a product manager uh, as a, for phytogenic liquids at EW Nutrition Germany. So presently I'm based in Germany and uh, I have completed my master's in veterinary medicine and MBA in international business. So I have a total 15 years of experience in a poultry and international business. So as Ton has mentioned, uh, during this webinar, I will be in the wings and answering your questions and supporting if any way needed. So thanks, thanks Ton, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, and I realize that I forgot to, um, to properly introduce myself. I'm Ton van Gerwe. I am a, a, twin, a poultry veterinarian, 20 years of uh, industry experience. I've worked in the nutritional R&D as well. And now I am leading the global technical team for EW Nutrition. And um, <coughs> I, I, uh, I, I am here from the Netherlands uh, uh, today where I, where I reside. Now, Lydio, um, please, you can start your presentation and um, um, yeah, uh, enjoy it. Thank you very much, Svan, for the, the presentation. So we, we go for today um, uh, for some issues that is related to animal health for poultry diseases, particularly for layers. 
we focus on respiratory outbreak because it's still uh, the main. So together with uh, enteric problems, respiratory is one of the main problems that we face in, mostly in Asia Pacific area. So, and uh, it is this what, with what went wrong because most of the places they come to me and say, I'm doing everything, but they're still facing some outbreaks in my farm. And so this is just outline of my presentation. We start for talk about the poultry resistance that feel challenging. And so the poultry has changed for the last couple of years, changing a lot actually. How to strengthen the poultry health. So some, um, some key uh, highlights that uh, we're gonna use for it. Vaccination, what is the critical point for bringing it to the practical perspective what we are doing on a daily basis and what is uh, should do, what should not do, and conclusion. But we start for the conclusion. So we start from the, uh, from the back, because usually when I go to farms, they are complaining about this, the disease that is already there. So you, you don't, sometimes you don't have uh, too much tools to, to solve because uh, they are already facing. And, and what you see, is a, a kind of a hot potato. People try to, to blame, blame the vaccines, blame the application, blame the weather. They are blaming everyone. And chickens, uh, you never understand this. So the problem continues in the farm. So apparently, we are improving the biosecurity. I see many companies, so key accounts, they are improving. They are putting a lot of uh, effort to, to improve the biosecurity. But why diseases are still popping up? Why they're still coming? You know, you know, why new diseases are popping up? If you see this, uh, this graph, it's showing the disease. This is one of the key accounts in Southeast Asia, showing the disease that they are facing from the 90s up to 2015. And then what we see here, so, so new diseases are, are really strongly affecting the birds. Some disease that in the 90s was not a big concern like astrovirus. Uh, currently this is a concern. And you see IBV, uh, low pathogenic AI, so it's coming more and more, even though we're improving them by security. One, one point that you have to discuss is that also the more you select, the more you see the lack of uh, resistance in this, this bird. So this is what we expect to 2050 following the, this uh, genetic uh, geneticist. So if you, if you wait for the 2015, you see layers, see how many eggs and uh, at, at uh, just uh, uh, 550, uh, eggs, just 550 eggs at uh, 100 weeks, it's a lot, no? It means that you, the performance will be pretty much good, but the resistance we expect that it is gonna um, go down. So this is what uh, we are afraid of. And if you check for the uh, disease uh, perspective, there are a couple of uh, papers published. I'm just uh, pointing this one in, from 2002 showing that the higher the performance, the lower the capability to produce antibodies. And I'm seeing many companies struggling to get titers for ND, and then they put one more vaccine, a second, a third, a fourth, and it's still struggling to get, for example, HI titers. But if you, if you see in the past, so the bird, uh, they could respond better. So there is no, no free lunch. So the more you improve it, you take the risk also to have less resistance. And I think also some uh, genetics line, they're trying to do their best to have the right balance with this. But here's the, how we think. So we go to companies and they are pretty much well defined in, in, in boxes. So this is nutrition, this is husbandry, genetic, poultry health, but in the reality, this never happened uh, such uh, um, isolated. Everything happens at the same time. And uh, uh, people who deal with uh, nutrition have to talk with animal health guys because it has everything to do. And what are column between these boxes? I call no man's land. So that's when you, you miss all the information and then you know, start open doors for outbreaks. Another point is that the virus and bacteria are constantly changing. 
So I think the, the one example that you can use clearly is Marek's disease is one of the diseases that is most studied throughout the years. So since long time, they have been studying and what they notice is every, roughly after, after every 20 years, the virus shifts the virulence for higher virulence, higher virulence. If you see here in 2000, 2002, we expect, in 2020, we're expecting to have maybe another different virus. And I'm seeing some places already facing different myelic disease, even though they are vaccinated with uh, uh, one or double shot of CVI vaccine for, for layers and for, and for breeders. So this is, Marix disease is still a huge, it's old disease, but it's huge concerns, concern. So one good example is uh, uh, Marix disease outbreak that affect uh, hardly Pakistan. And I also include here some places um, in Nepal and some other in Vietnam, but uh, Pakistan is, it was really caught my eye because you saw huge, um, not only uh, tumors lesions, but also some nervous lesions and high mortality, really high mortality. And we took those samples and we check, so don't get impressed that this, for this is light, this is, it's, it's quite busy, but I just show you. So in, for cluster A, there is a cluster A, B, C, and D. For cluster A, is basically the vaccine. What we got in these samples from there, we got, uh, and this is the sample that we got, and then we, we check that uh, there are differences in the number of uh, amino acids. So it, it was clear that it's not a vaccine. And also there is a one, uh, we calculate in a, a sequence of uh, uh, prolines, repeat sequence of prolines. So the lower the sequence, the more virulent is gonna be the, the virus. And we check that this virus that you got there is not only very virulent virus anymore, it was, it was what they are calling today hypervirulent virus, which uh, maybe we should have a different approach with this one. So, which we're still, we're still um, struggling in some areas, mostly in Southeast Asia, but also this in, in Pakistan. So, what happened with uh, IB, for example, infectious bronchitis? So uh, in the past, we, we saw a lot of uh, different strains that are called the variants, include the 491, so on. But what we're seeing on a daily basis now, so it, it changed a little bit. And you see, based on these papers published, like uh, roughly 60% they are related to QX and Q1 strain. So this is affecting uh, massively the flux, even though they are giving uh, sometimes even four times uh, variant vaccine. So still having a lot of um, uh, big concern on IB. What we did, we did a survey in 2019 uh, in places like Vietnam, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Philippines. What we saw, we got this uh, phylogenetic tree. And uh, when you check this, the sample that we got, the positiveness, you see that most of them were related with Q1 strain. And this Q1 strain, uh, which um, when you compare uh, for the homology, is, is far away from the, the being used in the field uh, that was related to 793B vaccine. What we saw, um, not only respiratory problem, but a, a lot of uh, cystic oviduct. And yes, some of when uh, the IB was affected during laying period, we saw some respiratory problem, but ultimately uh, a lot of uh, problem related to kidney lesions. So, why respiratory infections is so important to layers? Because just layers, we, we, we see also egg drop production. And with this egg drop production, uh, the bottom line would be like this, you start losing a lot of money. So the, what you see, what you have to keep in mind, so mostly of the respiratory bacteria uh, that cause uh, respiratory disease in poultry, they also you cause some problem related to um, uh, reproductive system issues. Why? Because as like you can see here, a normal, a normal epithelium with ciliate cells, and then when you come here, we are demonstrate with IB, they deciliate, they, they close, and they, they, they kill and they destroy this ciliate uh, epithelium. And uh, ultimately, you see this clinical signs and some rails and that evolute to coughing and so on and so forth. 
inside the chicken house. But we cannot forget that the same ciliate cells that you, you find there, you find as ciliate cells also in, in, in all the oviduct, ovary and oviduct, and also in kidneys. So you don't you forget that they like to replicate in this kind of cells. That's, that's the reason why you face this kind of uh, egg drop production or sometimes uh, misshaped eggs or uh, eggs with water, watery albumin. So, and it too depends where the virus replicated. If it replicated in a virus, replicated here in the magnum, replicated here in the uterus, they have a different affection in the bird. So this, this seminar is not only to discuss, it's not discuss uh, in general, but depend on the, the virus replicated, you have different affection. And this can happen with IV, ND, RT, MPV, MG, you have to consider. So all these that can affect the birds and the production. And, and when you see the, the production, you see this peak down. So it's different from, this is for IB, for example, sometimes uh, in, uh, Newcastle disease, but it's peak down, sometimes uh, never return to, to normal um, a curve. Me-shaped eggs, water albumin. So mostly when they, when they affect the magnum, you see this water albumin. So in, in flocks, that's roughly 30 to uh, 35 weeks of age. And this, uh, we can see here in the video, when I open one egg, so we also start uh, finding uh, some casts inside uh, the eggs that was related to APEC E. coli, so even pathogenic E. coli. So these two ladies, IB and uh, APEC, uh, they start playing and uh, uh, with, if you add these uh, antibiotic resistance, it's, it's a huge problem to the birds. Why we are so um, strict and putting and pushing uh, farms that they, they do have to vaccinate it since the first day of age? Because if you have early infection, uh, later on, when the, the, the birds should be on the peak, you see the silent layers or internal layers. And the consequence many times will be this, this kind of a cystic object. So the bird should be protected before going to the farm, not protected, vaccinated, sorry. So if you cannot vaccinate it there, you should vaccinate it um, in the box, in the farm before the start. So this is very important to have early protection. Another key point, and, uh, and I have a lot of uh, friends from Vietnam and also from Indonesia. They have been facing a lot of problems related to low, low pathogenic um, AI. I'm talking about H9N2. This H9N2 has been causing a lot of uh, um, companies to go to bankruptcy in, in, in places that I, to I told you before. And what we see, we don't see any change in the, the egg itself, if they are alone, if the virus is alone. But you see it's a huge egg drop production, 40, 45%, and never come back again. And when, when they crop see the birds, the only thing that we check is uh, ovary hemorrhages, which makes sense because uh, the virus like to rep replicate also there. But in the realities, we see this kind of a salad of disease in farms. So uh, I like to emphasize always that it never happen alone. They like to, to come together for the outbreaks. In this one, for example, I, uh, I, I went, I saw this uh, IT, MG, and infectious coronavirus in the same birds. So which is, quite difficult to control. And I have to pick the, the, the worst one and start controlling this first. How to control? This is the question. So you have to do your homework. So this graph, I just love this graph, is showing that uh, first, through the managing, management by security, given a good immune system, you, you reduce the challenge level, okay? And then you increase the resistance throughout the vaccination. So the bottom line is you have a, the, a bird with less chance to having the disease. You work with chance. So eradication in Southeast Asia talk, is, is too aggressive a word. Some that can succeed and stop for a while, but time to time the virus pop up. So 
you reduce the chance to have a problem. So I always use this kind. So I think you who, who saw my seminars a couple of times, uh, the virus never respect fences. So uh, many companies, they, they have uh, the biosecurity only fence in their property. And it's never enough. So someone can pass in front of your farm with uh, birds for discharge that they're full of hormonic disease. And then through the feathers, they, they get the birds. So how to control H9N2 in such situation? So remember that ducks, they can have the virus for a long time with absolutely no clinical sign. So very often we see uh, layer farms with this kind of situation and uh, having ducks uh, in the backyard. So we, you have to choose. And one of the main problems related to um, layers farms is that most of them, they keep multi-age uh, farm have this kind that they put the DOC close to the birds that they are have that have 30 35 weeks of age and this is a disaster so with this you can perpetuate the, the any kind of a disease mostly Marix for example and IB and the vaccine um, disease for a long time we did a trial in uh, Taiwan just to show we didn't change anything we just keep for example before we had all the rearing and laying period in the same area. So we just change and split this. So, and then we put the rearing and laying uh, different areas and see the result. So you see even for enteric problem, respiratory problem and expenses with antibiotic before and after. So this, this, uh, this mean a lot of money regarding this. A lot of uh, less resistance to antibiotic and because you have to use less than. Another point that is very common to see here is the over trusting in the disinfectant. And also it's true when you talk about uh, COVID, I see many places that people uh, that over trust on these and not doing the biosecurity uh, measures. So it's very common, uh, go to farms. I call this magic disinfection tunnel. Because people go from one side, they think they are contaminated and they, they think that through the tunnel they transform in SPF human. It has never happened. So also for a magic spray. So you have to do a homework for isolation, so on and so forth. It's not a matter of this. There is no, not even one paper showing that this kind of a tunnel really works. And I ask you, how to disinfect such a condition? This is uh, one of the conditions you see a lot of uh, infectious coriza. How do you control this? So you have the perfect condition for everything. I know that some of you have a very modern farms, but uh, um, still open farms, this kind of condition is, is, um, is very common. And it's not a matter of giving more vaccines. It's a matter, again, to uh, reduce the, the challenge in order that the vaccine can do their job. Water collinination is very inexpensive. It's very easy to use it, but unfortunately people are prefer to use antibiotic instead of using a good water sanitation. So chlorination, people are afraid to use it. I'm a, uh, who knows me, I'm a fan of using this. I'm, I was using even the companies, the production companies that are being worked with very good result. It means that less respiratory problem. And the total, uh, tolerance you, is very high. You see these papers published, if you want guys, I can send also a lot of papers published showing that chickens are very resistant to high chlorination. So my recommendation, you go through uh, at, at least available 5 ppm, but I easily, I do work for layers at 10 ppm of chlorine. Over trust in the vaccine. So this is a Newcastle disease. This is still um, a huge concern. Um, you know, sh should we call Java disease since it was discovered in Indonesia. But since 1926, is it still endemic in Asia? We should have more um, tools to control. 
with variable clinical signs, now different classification. You see the, those professors in, in Bangladesh, they reclassified for genotype 13, which is very important to understand. And unfortunately, the new technology, the chickens, they are not understand as something that will solve the problem. So vectors, a single alone solution is still too risky if you have change. If you don't have change, it's okay. But if you talk to the challenges from New Zealand to uh, Vietnam, it's totally different reality. So it's still the old fashioned uh, live plus kill vaccine in the US, sometimes vector, you makes the difference. So uh, another point is misdiagnosis or misinterpretation or trusting too much in, um, in the lab or using the lab as a, the, the whole new light. One point that I like also uh, always to emphasize is uh, MG. MG is, is still a huge concern in Southeast Asia. Um, I would put in uh, all Asia and MS I put in all over the world. But MG, for example, people come to me that they, they are negative. And I just ask you, how many times do you sample? How many samples do you have that are used to sample? All these points is very important to, to try to, to control. For example, in this graph, if you sample before uh, in the first two months, antibodies will be low. If you rely on antibodies, antibodies will be low. But PCR positivity will be higher. So what we you should do, you should collect both PCR and serology. Never rely on only one. And you see in the beginning of the infection, they have a high vertical transmission, but they, have, they still have a low antibodies. That's the reason why I always emphasize the absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, as my professor, Paul Lorenzo, used to tell me. So the fact that it's negative doesn't mean that it's really negative. You have to go into in deep, deep inside the outbreak. So how to, to strength? First, before talk about respiratory disease, you have to focus on immune response. Is this bird capable to respond? And uh, this is the top uh, 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 immunosuppression disease that uh, we see, um, I think they can classify in the world. Uh, definitely the number one is the, what I call the ghost of mycotoxin. Why I call the ghost? Because it's there, it's caused the damage or something, but everybody, people are just not looking for, not uh, believing on this. Follow, followed by IBD, cheek anemia, Marek's disease, real virus, and so on. Every day you have a, a different virus that uh, they are reclassifying as a suppression virus. And if you think that uh, you should not talk to a um, feed meal manager, you should just take a look at this graph. This is a, a titration, ELISA, for uh, Gumboro disease and Newcastle disease. In, in a different treatment from zero PPB, and talk about, I talk about PPB, not PPM, of uh, aflatoxin up to 400 PPB. You see that the higher the, the mycotoxin challenge, the lower the response for the serology perspective at six weeks of age for broilers. And we have to take care of this. Why? Because this can cause a huge damage to your farm. And, and sometimes you don't realize it. So, what does gut health has to do with all this immune response? It has everything to do. Since gut is considered one of the biggest immune system organs, so most of the IgA is located there. The bird is e eating every single day different um, um, uh, vitamin, different everything. The, the gut has to deal with this. So the immune system has to be very strong. And uh, one thing I, I like to, I always show is this, this one. So you see this graph, this is the age, and this is the bursa weight. So for, for these birds here, they, they just arrive and they give food and water at the same time. For this one bird right here in this line, they just wait for uh, 24 hours. You see that the bursa weight will be quite lower. So it means that the earlier the bird gets in the farm, start eating properly, eating well, available, ad libitum, the, the better you be the response for not only for the gut, but all the immune system. So the earlier they get, the better you be. And don't you forget the gut 
is uh, is part of the mouth, so mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, and most of IgA comes from from this area. What we we did also to cross this information in the past, when I was still I was still working in in Brazil, we uh, we did this um, with the support of uh, Immunova, and so it's um, a company that do cytometry in uh, in Brazil. So in, uh, with the uh, Federal University of Paraná. And what we check, so because this company, they have a high uh, mycotoxin problem during the high, uh, high emitted season. What they, they did, they did in a large scale. They compare when they use one kilo of mycotoxin by the per ton versus two kilos, which uh, supposed to be better because the challenge was not only with aflatoxin, but also fumonisin was higher. So they come up with, okay, let's do a cytometry to see uh, what is the difference for this after the vaccination with IBV and IBD. So one of the cells that they were um, count, counted was uh, CD4, so TCRV beta one, that this, uh, this cell is related to IgA. I mean, they help to formation for, for forming IgA. So, and ultimately you have more IgA, you have a more, uh, local protection for respiratory disease, so have a more condition for local protection. And what we see here for the for with this one only the vaccine in one kilo, the vaccine plus two kilos, and only the vaccine, you see at the 14 and 21 days of age, you see a higher amount, significant amount, higher amount of uh, C CD4 or T helper, and for for this case, for example, that you ultimately produce more IgA, they give you more condition for that. So maybe for the future, you can also challenge the birds seeing this difference. Another point that is really causing stress, uh, causing a huge immunosuppression is stress. If you stress the bird, you have a um, problem to response. One of, uh, one of the points is related, for example, with IoT. So when you give the vaccine here, the uh, zero, and then you see the peak of replication, the positiveness and then the virus goes down and they stay in latency and through germinal gland ganglia so they stay there so it's normal for the vaccine also sometimes few the virus can stay there so if you have some stress what happens is start having different peaks even with the vaccination and that's what that's what they complain about uh, reaction sometimes so you have a cycling cycling and increases the chance of uh, the, the virus mutation what we do for the vaccination, what we try to do, first of all, vaccine, live vaccine are very important. Companies might, might make more money with a kilo vaccine, but for your farm, live vaccine is far more important, if you can tell, because they block the virus since the beginning. If it is blocking fail, you have a second layer of protection that will be systemic which then, then kill vaccine, you play, you play a very good role. So this, this, that's the reason why I'm pretty much focused on live vaccine as well. So this paper was published a long, long time ago, just showing that what happened when we have a give you live vaccine. This is the ELISA, and this is throughout the day, we give a IB vaccine here. So for the, for when you see the titers in the cerebral, I mean the blood, takes long time to start going up. But if you collect tears, you see a huge amount of IgA since the beginning and going up, going up. So which is related to uh, local protection. And actually we are not measuring this IgA, which is very important for, for the bird protection. And what is the, the gold standard vaccination? For uh, IB, for example, ND, supposed to be uh, eye drop because we are giving eye drop one per one and the bird you have to wait three to four seconds. They absorb this, but the, the absorption will be roughly 50% because the rest of 50% goes to the gut. That's the reason why the bird start uh, deglutinating this one. So and you can see here, um, following the jackwood uh, uh, 
publication, you see that the 10 days, roughly 10 to seven to 10 days after the vaccination, you see almost 100% will be positive. But what we see on daily basis? You see daily basis, they're, they're giving the uh, eye drop vaccination to uh, four, five, sometimes six birds at the same time, and they don't have time to wait for absorption. If you don't try, we struggle with training, but uh, this happens on a daily basis. So what we do, we uh, strongly um, uh, push customers for using spray vaccination. Even the hatchery, which is supposed to be at least 15 ml per, per day, 100 AUC. If you cannot vaccinate in the hatchery, they should vaccinate in the box, in the farm, uh, the same time when they arrived. And there are many different methods that you can, so it's not the intention to go there. No, but uh, there are some key points that you should go through. And also during laying period. So considering that uh, some places, they have such high challenge that you have to repeat the vaccination also during laying period, which in this case, I like, I like to use not less than two liters per 1,000 hands. And yes, it's a lot of water, but uh, in this way, you have the preening effect. The birds start preening, and then the, virus, the, the vaccine uh, solution goes to the eyes and nose, so, so on. What is the effect in the hatchery if you use uh, 7, 14, or 21 ml? I know that the many places they are really, really stubborn to use 10 ml, even though there are a lot of uh, uh, papers showing that they should not. Uh, for example, if you use uh, here, uh, if you use seven, seven ml, you have 71% of losses. I mean, 1.4 log, 40 ml, roughly the same because it, it was uh, the beginning was uh, 4.3 logs, and 21 ml, you have less losses. So the bottom line is that don't be afraid to vaccinate. If you vaccinate in the hedge, or yes, some companies they, they have even the spray machine the same that they have in the hatchery in the farm, don't be afraid to use it um, to get the, the DOC wet. Another point that you have to emphasize is uh, water temperature. This is showing to the hatchery, but I use for all of them. I live in Bangkok, so sometimes here is flat, 30, 33, 34 um, uh, grows Celsius here. It's, it's a lot. So, if you use, for example, this, this was probably, uh, published by Jordan. If you use cold water to dilute the vaccine, let's put uh, around uh, what the recommendation two to eight degrees and keep it after that in a cold environment so you don't lose the vaccine after two hours. If you prepare in cold water and then you keep this vaccine in the, um, an environment that is, not, is the, like a room temperature, you start losing. Uh, some so when I remember that is logarithmic, so it's, it's a lot. But if you prepare in the 25 degrees water and you keep at 25, for example, or even 30 degrees, you might be giving only water to the bird. So you have to pay attention to these. This is very important. Not only water temperature, but the uh, uh, water pH, which the, the virus might be quite sensitive. So what we are doing with the vaccine, so let's consider this. This is the field challenge, and this is the chicken. And then we have one guy here that is called onset of immunity. So onset has to be faster than field challenge. Let's have this, this situation, the challenge is, is trying to get the chicken and then come the onset of immunity before that. And this is really, really true for uh, um, pathogens like uh, MG. I'm seeing farms giving uh, MG vaccine at the three weeks, four weeks of age, which for me is uh, sometimes is really a waste of time and money because the bird will be already positive. So if you can apply the vaccine as early as possible, it will be better because you are protecting the bird before the change and the vaccine will play the, the role. And one of the last slides are coming through. So, I mean, you have to adjust the, the, the vaccine uh, homology to, uh, to the challenge. This is true. So there is the tendency, this is the percent of homology. This is the percent of a protection. 
there is a tendency that the higher the homology, the lower the protection, but sometimes you have a lower homology, but higher protection. What you have to do is try on, so not always they work at the same time. So uh, the, the phylogenetic tree and homology, they are good stuff only as a reference, but you have to try on real life as well. And in this one, uh, for IT vaccination, I see a lot of people work me and complaining about reaction for IIT. This, uh, this was published in 1999, and I think this is still used today. It's very nice to see that, for example, if you give IIT vaccine by eye drop, you said we have a peak very soon, roughly 90% roughly of the bird to be positive. And then they go down. So they did the work for boosting IgA here and protecting the bird, and they go down. So you don't need that, that much to keep the, the IgA there. If you give it by um, water or spray, you see the lower peak in the beginning, lower peak in the beginning, but then it start going up, going up. What, what the hell is this going up? This going up is like no more than a rolling reaction. And that is that when the people call you that, the, uh, doctor, I'm seeing a lot of uh, uh, respiratory problem after IRT vaccination, so on and so forth. So you should use it. If you can use by eye drop, it'll be better. If you cannot use by eye drop, you can, you can use by nose drop. Is one option. If you cannot use by by nose drop, you can use also by a vent brush. Okay. The last one you be by water. So. Uh, in the past, the vaccine were developed even both of them. So mostly, so for example, tissue culture is only for eye drop, for example, but we're developed for individual application, not for drinking water or so on. But uh, when the poultry uh, business start growing, they start having the, the necessity to go for mass application. And then when you open door for this recycling, and also, as you know, uh, you can also shift the, uh, the pathogenesis of some uh, virus in the field. So individual applications is still gold standard for ILT. You need to have uh, people enough for application. And last but not least, people are still worry about overreaction. So you have to choose uh, what you have to do if you have seen in places that uh, the bird that has good immune system, less reaction, plus the right rate to, uh, to apply the vaccine. In conclusion, so it's always an um, uphill battle and an uphill battle. It's, it's never easy to control. And I see that the birds, you get more sensitive. So there is no way back. So the bird, you get better, period. But, the, but more sensitive. So chickens are getting more sensitive through the time. Be aware, new disease can pop up. But viruses and bacteria are constantly changing. So add that, this will be complicated. By security, back to the basis, training, training, training. Before anything, build a strong immune system. If you don't have, if the chicken doesn't have a strong immune system, they cannot respond. So we are wasting your money. And vaccination can do a very job, but when you need. So uh, I work with that, with vaccines, and sometimes I say, you don't need that much vaccination. So all you have to do is adapt to the way you're, you're applying for. Excess of a vaccination is also quite costly. So you have to adapt and use it wisely, to, depending on the challenge. When it's necessary and accounts with the challenge, this is very important. And uh, last but not least, in a correct way. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Sorry, I'm, I might stand a little bit, but uh, uh, we are open for questions. Thanks. Thanks, Ludio. So I, I will take one question here, uh, which is talking about uh, using the essential oil based spray or in water can reduce ILT reaction post-shifting. And uh, yes, uh, ILT is generally known to have uh, a lot of vaccine reactions when it is being used as a live vaccine. And uh, uh, we can have a, a lot of vaccine reactions like bird can suffer from oculonasal uh, lesions, discharges. Uh, there would be a respiratory rinse, gurgling sound. 
and especially if it is happening uh, during the growing stage also can have impact on the feed consumption so which may also disturb the uniformity and cv percentage of the birds uh, which can affect on the uh, production performance during the laying stage so to avoid these kind of uh, vaccine reactions yes we can support the birds uh, with uh, some immunomodulators uh, uh, and is if particularly essential oil based or phytomolecule based uh, we, we would suggest uh, to use some uh, phytomolecule based products which are coming with a uh, mucolytic activity or immunomodulation activity like menthol or 18 cineol which can support uh, symptomatically uh, to overcome this vaccine reactions uh, by their good mucolytic activity and immunomodulation which supports the bird's immunity and uh, it can help into prevention of negative effects of the vaccine which can help into stabilization of uh, feed consumption and it also supports the bird's immunity um i'll i'll continue with one on nutrition um there was a question what is the nutritional management in case of ibv infectious bronchitis or ibd gumboro in case of poultry so um I'm focusing that answer on layers, and we know layers are quite susceptible to uh, Gumboro disease, to, to use Gumboro disease as an example. And um, I know from experience that in an outbreak of Gumboro, it can be uh, helpful to um, slightly reduce and restrict the feed intake, because the feed intake is an additional uh, stressor for, for, a, for a flock during an outbreak. So uh, not not strongly restricting but some reduction in feed allowance can help them to get through an ibd infection more easily for ibv i would not recommend any nutritional um uh any nutritional application uh although yeah um, water applications like uh, vitamins vitamin c uh can be considered uh, of course to 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 provide some additional support I have a one question here that like is uh, what is your opinion on revaccinating live IB and D vaccines in production or which vaccines to use and when to start and repeat? This is a good question. I like to use the, the people that have the standard response, like telling that uh, every eight, six to eight weeks, they should repeat the vaccination. I will tell you depend on. So first you have to check how is the chain in your farm? and then uh, to use this but if you can use this the standard uh, people start giving the vaccination during laying period after 24 weeks of age sometimes they stop during the the peak of a production and they keep the interval for um, uh, six to seven weeks and apply if you have huge problem with ib try on giving spray there are many different sprays that are doing well so I like to, to, to give the spray vaccination during the feeding times, early morning, chickens will be more calm. And then you go for the spray, the spray has to be silent and they open for two sides and then they go through the, the cage. There are many different for different uh, kinds of uh, chicken uh, houses. So yes, you can use it, you should use it. Sometimes you need a variant strain. Sometimes you need a violent strain. For example, like Q1, depend on the have on the challenge. That's the reason why you have to understand what is your challenge in your farm before take it. Is it really IB or is it ND or you just uh, running reactor for some IT? So first of all, before changing this, go and understand what is the challenge. Um, yeah, there's a question, a practical question about live vaccination and if antibiotic treatment needs to be stopped at the time of live vaccination. Um, you know, um, if the live vaccination is a virus and uh, particularly when you apply it separately from the way how the antibiotic is being applied. Um, so either by spray when, when, um, when antibiotics are done by the water but 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 even in general, they do not interact with each other. Um, um, but it's always good practice when you apply a vaccine through the drinking water that you have the cleanest possible water, to not to avoid any risk of 
an inactivation of these uh, uh, of these of the vaccine, which is typically a virus and very sensitive to the de de deactivation. So, if at least at the time of vaccination, which is only a short period, I would always take out antibiotics from the drinking water if vaccinating through that same route of administration. When you apply by spray, you don't have to stop antibiotic treatment. There's one question here. Uh, in Borrelia breeders, how can I control the IT uh, reaction, which you are seeing after 45 days of, of the vaccination? If you're seeing the reaction for IT, it means that uh, the application, you're, you're having a problem. Um, among the vaccines, if a tissue culture, a chicken embryo, they are different in reaction. But sometimes if you have a high challenge, you should go for a uh, chicken embryo vaccine. If you have a controllable uh, challenge, tissue culture can play a good role. But uh, as long as I know here, the challenge in Southeast Asia, for example, is quite high. They go for chicken embryo. And then what they do, as I said before, first we try to use by eye drop. It's still has a huge reaction, go for nose drop. And if it's still facing problem, there is a, one method. You can also contact me later on. Uh, there is a, a, a vent brush vaccination, which there is not that much papers published showing the protection with this, but uh, my practical experience that uh, is, yes, it's working fine with uh, no clear um, reaction, but in the clock, you see the vaccine take after five days of the vaccination. Uh, I, I will take one question here. Uh, it's from Dr. Rakesh Nimbalkar. Uh, do you recommend IB and ND vaccination every four to six weeks in commercial lay and broiler breeder during lay? So, Dr. Rakesh, uh, yes, there are some farms uh, which follow this kind of schedule during the lay, but we don't recommend to have this kind of uh, uh, as, a, as a standard uh, protocol because it's, it's of course also have a stress on the birds during the lay and can also have impact on the production. Uh, so it, it can be followed just based on the, uh, the, the, the immunity um, uh, check and we can have a regular immunity check about the titers for MB and ND, especially for the breeders. We can also do it for progeny to, ch to have a check on the maternal antibodies level. And if during any draw case only, we would recommend to go for a vaccination. So which help us to have a continuous uh, monitoring on the immunity as well as uh, to also avoid some impact of this vaccination during the lay. Doctor? I see, I see some companies giving the, the vaccine during the, from six to eight weeks of age. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it can be a problem for, for, replic for the virus replication. You do have to pay attention to the rolling reaction. Uh, check if you, there is any MEG problem uh, before that. And if you, there is an MEG, you increase the chance of a rolling reaction with them. So, if the vaccine will be six or will be within eight weeks of age, sometimes they like even to use a five weeks uh, uh, window. Depend on the channel that they have in the farm, basically. So in, in some, some additives you, which you can boost um, your immune system, but first of all, we keep the, everything fine for environment and so on. As I said, the stress, they can boost a reaction as well. <clears throat> uh, uh, there is there is one more. Uh, to answer, just this one will be will be fast. So any effect uh, of we add the dose of the vaccine for ND spray vaccine better or not? Yes, um, I think it's, it's a wise question. You you can add no problem at all. You see some of the vaccines that have a 10 by the power of 4.1, uh, 4.2. I don't see any effect of uh, adding, especially if in the farm you cannot, you have a such um, uh, warm water. So 
yes, you can use, you can, you can even double the dose with no problem at all for my experience so far. Um, yeah, then uh, let me, uh, one question about what is a good interval for live respiratory virus. You would typically see that there is a recommendation not to, vac not to have any other vaccination 14 days prior and 14 days after. Practically, this can be challenging. I know this, uh, vaccine schedules are busy. So I would say if there is no, no severe vaccination response from the previous vaccination, that a vaccination at 10 days after the previous one is, 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 is very well, uh, can, can be effective, is, is appropriate. And, uh, um, but as I said, the vaccination response like can sometimes occur after uh, ILT vaccination, that would have, that should make you decide to delay the, the subsequent vaccination. So it is important to have uh, um, um, some space in that, in the vaccination schedule. And it's also good to look at compatibility of different strains or combination vaccines products. And, but but, but all, also always ask the supplier to, for good documentation if 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 uh, a combination of vaccines are working and both simultaneously having a good immunity development and secondly if there is a combined vaccine and there was also a question on that today let's say if there is too many strains in one life vaccine uh, uh, let's ask critical questions about if each and one of them is able to to build up specific immunity so um, Ludio, you can address one final question and then we need to uh, move towards the end already. Uh, there, is, there is one here. So how to identify early IB infection in less than two weeks of uh, two weeks old uh, chickens? I think um, this, is a, this is a good question. Some day, if you give the vaccine, uh, probably you will find the, the vaccine virus there. But um, people, they like to swab the, the trachea, and like they collect kidneys, they collect the cicatonsil, which is cicatonsil is very important. So the virus, they, they like to stay there for a long time, and then you can, can get the PCR diagnosis. So I will not go for serology. For this case, you, you should collect a sample for, for PCR, which you can identify the virus. It's, it's far better. So don't you forget to sample Sika tonsil, but the fact that the Sika tonsil is positive doesn't mean uh, necessarily that the, the, the IB will be a, the big uh, uh, role causing the damage. So you have to cross this information with the, the outbreaks as well, if you are facing some clinical respiratory problems. Okay. Good. Um... We have a couple of more minutes. The, the poll question at the end will only take one. So there is actually room for, um, for one more question. Any uh, um, Ritterats or uh, Ludio, you have one in mind here. Um, Okay, I see here one. Ludio, you mentioned that we should vaccinate for MEG as early as possible. Is, is the bird's immune system developed enough to, to accommodate immunity for this before 21 days of age? Excellent question. And what about the maternal immunity interference? So, uh, yes, this, um, the birds, there are some papers showing also that the birds, as early as, as uh, five to seven days of incubation, they, they start already sending some lymphocyte cells to some uh, organs. So, Regarding if the bird is, is immune competent to response or if they, they are capable to response for this MG since the first day of age, yes, yeah, they can res respond out well. And uh, so you don't need to wait up to 21 days of age, which they will be already positive. There are many alternatives to use MG. So not really F strain you can vaccinate in the first day. Of, of age, but even though some they are vaccinated because they are afraid of uh, changing the field, but there are some others like K strain that you can use since the first days of age with no problem at all. So remember, you have to get there before the challenge. That's the reason why. So sometimes it's not a matter of the strain, but it's a matter of occupying the space before the, uh, the field challenge. 
Uh, what about uh, maternity immunity interferences? No, I don't consider maternity bodies that will be a, uh, a big role for interference in this way. Uh, for this, for this vaccine, for example, because we are talking about mucosa, mucosa protection for respiratory. I don't think for this one, the experience that we have given the first day, you have a huge role on this. Thank you, Ludio. Thank you for your thank presentation you. today. And um, uh, obrigado. Eh? Uh, ah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, we have to... Um, leave some of these questions uh, of the many questions that came in during the Q&A session. Uh, interesting questions. We have to leave them unanswered. But if you, if your question is not answered through the, the entire webinar, then you can submit your questions to marketing ewnutrition.com and our marketing department will redirect these questions to, to, to Ludio, to myself and to Rutraj so we can answer you. Um, there is, uh, please take one minute of your time at the, uh, at the end to, um, uh, to answer the, the poll. Um, yeah, um, I would like to thank you for your attendance and um, uh, hope that you attend one of the future uh, webinars. There is uh, more uh, coming up soon. So uh, please pay attention to our LinkedIn uh, channel and our website to, uh, to uh, sign up on, uh, on time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan. And thank you, Lurio. So there was one point that uh, one of participants was asking about the presentation. So uh, this uh, uh, recording would be available on EW Nutrition uh, webinar page. You can see this uh, uh, recording after a couple of days. It would be available there. Thank you. And have a, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.